For the last 46 years, a war has raged across the continent of North America, killing over 800,000. This week, the two sides have come to a peace agreement, which will partition the continent into two sovereign countries. With hopes for lasting peace, the world welcomes the new nation of suburbia. Tomorrow is a highway broad and fair, and we are the many who'll travel there. Tomorrow is a highway broad and fair, and we are the many who'll build it there, and we will build it there. Come, let us build a way for all mankind, a way to leave these evil years behind. To travel onward to a better year Where love is and there will be no fear Where love is and no fear just been dropped off at one of the most secure borders in the world. This behind me is the only checkpoint for miles in either direction. And on the other side is the nation of suburbia. Very little is known about the mysterious suburban regime and the people forced to live under its rule. So today, we're going behind the asphalt curtain that so many have died trying to cross to show you what it's really like to live inside the cul-de-sac kingdom and if there's any hope for change. This neighborhood is an excellent example of some of the strict policies imposed by the regime that would be unthinkable in the free world. For a mile in all directions, the houses must be two stories tall, spaced 100 feet apart, and can be built within 25 feet of the lot's edge. People are also allowed to only live in family units as defined by the regime, and the rules don't just stop there. Loyalty to the regime is enforced by a vigilante group known as the Homeowners Association, which regulates everything from the color of tiles to the length of grass ready to punish anyone who steps out of line. You might have noticed that there are sidewalks, but nobody's using them. That's because these sidewalks don't go anywhere. To prevent social connections from forming, suburbanites are housed in compounds called subdivisions, which can't be exited easily on foot. And there's nothing to walk to anyway. The regime has banned all businesses for a mile radius and consolidated public spaces as far away from housing as possible. The only quasi-public spaces allowed are business centers, dominated by multinational corporations able to negotiate with the regime. And that right there is a crack in the system, where the citizens can briefly come into contact with each other. So, we decided to go to one. Um, how would you feel about uh, if this parking lot, say, were uh, apartments were built on it? Oh, absolutely no way. No. I mean... I don't think the problem is how many homes we have. Like, there's, there's a lot of empty places. I mean, that's gonna generate a lot more traffic on roads that don't accommodate that. No, I, I don't think so. I think they'll leave it the way it is for the, you know, the, the public that needs to get here and get what they have to. Two years ago, this was farmland and forest. Levittown, now one of the 10 largest cities in Pennsylvania. For workers anywhere else in the world, this would be a miracle in itself. From suburbia's independence in the 1950s, the citizens have been raised in a cocoon of propaganda. They've been taught that people on the outside are worse off and envy the suburban lifestyle. But despite taking in enormous property tax revenues, the regime struggles to provide its citizens with even the most basic infrastructure, like sidewalks, bike lanes, street lights, utilities, and public transportation. Poor government planning and sprawling infrastructure makes the suburban economic system the most inefficient and resource intensive in the entire world. It's a failed experiment that most nations abandoned decades ago. Thankfully, the highway of lies dividing the suburban people from the outside is finally showing cracks. This is a city located on the outskirts of suburbia, 
It was built long before the partition, and today it serves as a refuge for defectors, many of whom come here for work or education. Here, suburbanites can experience a walkable urban structure, high-speed rail, and a free bus system with 10-minute headways for the first time in their lives. You would think that suburbia's population would be rapidly shrinking, but instead it is growing, because suburbanites have nowhere else to go. During the land use war, suburbia's forces encircled the existing urban enclaves. So when the partition was signed, it created a continent where the only walkable places left are the ones that got grandfathered in. This has forced defectors and existing urban citizens into a fight over limited pre-partition housing, where the loser is forced to live in the dying nation of suburbia. Since 1990, the outpost of New Brunswick has increased its population by 33%, taking in thousands of more defectors. And there's still room for more. For instance, this parking garage right here can still be converted into apartments. But still, there's no way we can rescue every suburbanite by relocating them to existing cities. Instead, we'll have to take land back from suburbia. 20 miles to the east, the government of Eatontown is planning an attack against a suburban base known as Monmouth Mall. After years of decline, the mall is poorly manned and vulnerable. If all goes to plan, Eatontown can use this opportunity to annex the mall with a rapid assault of mixed-use infill development. They will then be able to populate the new neighborhood with suburban defectors, a strategy that is not only tactically effective, but profitable to investors and developers. Malls like these are usually located along wide arterials, perfect corridor for building rapid transit, allowing urban forces to quickly advance past enemy lines. But the most effective attacks come from inside. With a concerted effort, urbanist revolutionaries can infiltrate a local government, begin chipping away at the ideology of the regime, and get the planners to begin implementing urbanist infrastructure changes. And initially, they'll suck at it. For instance, the people who designed this bike trail in East Setauket thought they were supposed to make it squiggly. Also, the people who designed this bike lane didn't realize that these things would just get mowed down by snow plows, nor did they realize that a bus lane needs to be wider than seven feet. But here's the thing, they were on the right track. Because the regime has banned the study of alternative transportation modes for so long, relearning it is going to be a long process, but worth it nonetheless. Long ago, the people of North America lived in vibrant, walkable towns and cities, connected by the best public transportation in the world. And then, the land use war destroyed it all. Since the partition, the rogue state of suburbia has continued to expand its borders ever outward, leveling thousands of acres every day. Suburbia's sparse and highly mechanized development pattern gave them the upper hand back in the land use war. But 80 years after the partition, it has led the suburban economy to the brink of collapse. Most of the people who grew up out in the sprawl want to leave. After a century of darkness, this continent is ready for change. And if you believe in urbanist teachings, but you live in suburbia, then I guess I just want you to know that you have the power to fight back against the ludicrous rules and terrible decision making imposed on you by your local government. You deserve to live in a place that is walkable, sustainable, and affordable, where the needs of humanity come before the needs of cars. So what are you waiting for? Go start a revolution. <laughs>